we open. But a certain time actually is supposed to be uh, 3.45. Yeah, but based on your announcement, I thought, I think it is 1.30, right? Yeah, I said that the starting point yeah. for the seminar is 1.30. I just, yeah. I just use, yes. I so, just use so, a so I think, I think function to define okay. the Okay, okay. After, after you finish, we are going to start. Okay. Look. Okay, let's... let's... Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are going to present uh, a new concept in vector optimization. And the topic is an efficient, fastness, stiffly conjugate gradient algorithm for vector optimization. And here with me, the, we are going to Two of us are going to present. That is uh, I, Jamilia Haya, and sorry, sorry, Jamilia. That is okay, Ibrahim. I cannot hear your screen. You cannot see your screen. I, I too cannot see your screen. Yeah. Oh. Okay. 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 Let me share, share again. Okay, now, now we can see your screen. Yeah. You can all see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um the presenters are actually uh, Mr. Jamilia Hair and Yeah, that's okay, Brian. Okay, under the supervision of Professor Dr. Punkuma. So this is the outline of our presentation. Okay, um, vector optimization coming. How do I remove this? Sorry for the inconvenience. The design, how do I? Hello, Jamil. You are please un unmute your microphone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. We'll start with the motivation for studying vector optimization problem. So vector optimization problems are a significant extension of multi-objective optimization and multi-criterion optimization or multi-criterion decision-making problems, which has a large number of real applications in real life. In vector optimization, the preference order is related to an arbitrary clause and converse cone rather than the non-negative alternate. So some of these applications are in economics theory, management science, and engineering design. So since the, uh, the introduction of the Pareto optimality solution in 1896, we have been seeing several types of or several applications in this direction. So typical example of vector optimization model include maximization or minimization of the objective pairs, time, cost, benefit, cost, mean and variance, ETC. So this can be viewed as follows. Uh, the model of uh, vector optimization model may look in the, in, in the case of an application in a, in a direction like uh, maximizing radiation on tumors when a patient is going to be, have a, going to have, is going to have a uh, body full scan uh, while minimizing the, the radiation on the surrounding healthy tissue. So uh, vector optimization problem can also be applied in location problem analysis 
where, for example, if you are, for example, now you want to establish a, uh, or you want to construct a cafeteria in a school, and you don't want anyone to be victimized. That is, you want the location of that particular cafeteria to be at a center where the president building, the student hostel, the, the lecture halls, and the uh, and uh, staff quarters may not be far away from the from the location of the cafeteria. So, uh, in this kind of model, we can have we can have a solution to such a problem in such a way that nobody will be far away from the uh, cafeteria. Okay, similarly, similarly you can also, also apply it in, in, in environmental energy consumption so as to, to maximize the, the comfort. Okay, similarly, also we can um, minimize uh, price of a given uh, item while maximizing the comfort. So as an introduction, uh, in this uh, presentation, we are going to consider two forms of unconstrained observation problem. The first one is the unconstrained single objective unconstrained uh, observation problem, and the second one is the unconstrained vector observation problem. But our main focus will be on the latter one. Precisely, we present hazardous and stable type conjugate method for solving vector of margin problem. Okay, so now let's consider the this uh of margin problem. We we are the function f of x is we we are the function f of x is the x where this n is the dimension of x, which we assume to be last large. And the, the quantity degraded method is one of the efficient methods for solving this kind of problem due to its efficiency and low memory requirement. So the, it generates a sequence of approximation to the solution of uh, the given problem by using uh, equation two, where this is the initial approximation of the solution. And this uh, alpha k is the step size. This dk is the size direction, where the, the step size can be obtained by using a line size strategy which can be exact or in exact uh, line search where in the exact we tend to obtain an exact step from one point to another so that we did not uh, underestimate or overestimate the, the minimum. Then we, 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 whereas in the inexact line search, we tend to find a suitable step that, that will satisfy the, the given condition. And the search direction is given by equation three where this graph f of x stands for the gradient of the given function, and this beta k is known as the conjugate gradient parameter. But specifically in this uh, presentation, we consider this conjugate gradient parameter to be the hazard of steps. So, so the, the definition of the hazard of steps, the yk is given by the difference between the, 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 the gradients, and the, uh, this symbol stands for, for the usual uh, inner product. And other, uh, other well known beta cases are the Fletcher Arabs, Polar Rebek, Polar CG, Conjugate uh, Descent, Levan Story, and the Dan Young. But it is a well known fact that the FR, CD, and the DIO algorithm satisfy the well known uh, sufficient descent conditions, which guarantee that a sufficient descent to the solution of the given a problem. That is, whenever the wolf lines and wolf line search are employed. Where this C is greater than or equal to zero. However, the PRP, HS, and LS algorithm do not necessarily generate a descent direction whenever the wolf lens such are employed. So according to Poet, the PRP, HS, and LS algorithm can cycle without approaching a solution of uh, the given problem whenever an inexact lens such is, is used. So um, in what follows, we are going to consider the Consider an unconstrained vector optimization problem. Uh, that is problem six, where f is a map is a function from Rn to Rm, is continuously differentiable function, and k is a subset of the uh, image of the function, which is closed, convex, and pointed cone with non-empty interior. So, as I have mentioned earlier, the preference order here is related with uh, convex cone. So, uh, we are going to define o. Um, introduce the concept of partial order in RM, which is induced by K, as you can see the notation here. 
And again, uh, respectively, uh, this notation with respect to K induced by what? The interior of K is defined by this. That is U is less of V with respect to K if and only if V minus U is in K. Respectively, U is list of K, U, U is list of V with respect to K if and only if V minus U is in the interior of K. So the Pareto, the Pareto uh, optimal, the, the optimality uh, concept here is replaced by the Pareto optimality or Pareto efficiency. So it's a point actually X bar in RN such that there exists no other point X in RN with the relation F of X is list of F of X bar with respect to K and F of X is not equals to F of X bar. So in other words, this is a way of finding unconstrained minimizers for F with respect to the partial order induced by K. You can, one can see problem uh, reference number nine for more details of this concept. So before we go deep into the presentation, at least we need to look at some basic concepts. So vector optimization problem or uh, multi-objective or multi-criteria decision making have close relation with ordering or preferences in objective spaces. It is known that the orderings in a vector space can be defined by a convex cone. So first of all, we need to know what a convex is, which I believe we all know what convex is. Uh, as you can see from the graph here, above we have the mathematical definition of a convex, while in the picture here, we have the, uh, a picture representing a convex and a non-convex set. Also, definition of a cone, we have the mathematical definition above there, and here we have the pictorial representation of a cone. And one important thing also is the convex cone, which we have the definition as uh, a convex cone uh, is a set C is said to be a convex if it is a cone as well as convex. So we have the pictorial representation as here. Then one more important thing is the pointed cone, which uh, define as intersection of a positive and a negative cone, which is equal to uh, a singleton zero. And we have the uh, representation pictorially here. As you can see, there is this intersection of these lines, green, red, and blue. That is where we have the uh, pointed cone. And one more important uh, concept that we need to know is the convex hole. So a convex hole is just a kind of a process of forcing a shape to be a convex that is not actually a convex. For example, if you consider the left-hand side square here, you will see we have several dots, but we cannot say without the, the, the boundary of the square, we cannot say that this dot can be convex. But if you draw a line, as you can see from where we have this arrow, that is by the right part of the hand of the square, we have this shape and this shape indicates that the polygon indicated there is actually a convex because you can always, from any point there, you can always uh, draw a line segment touching another which will still remain in the polygon. So uh, we are now going to look at what we call an order, order relation, which is denoted as this. It's said to be reflexive if this relation holds and asymmetric if X is list of Y and Y is list of X implies that X is equal to Y. Transitive if X is list of Y and Y is list of Z implies that X is list of Z. So an order relation is called partial order if the, if the three conditions mentioned above hold. So in principle, in any non-empty subset C of Y can define an order relation by uh, a relation saying Y is list of Z with respect to C if and only if z minus y is in c for all y z in y. So this is a typical example of a uh, partial order relation. So here we are going to present some important results we use in the proof of the descent property and the global convergence. Uh, we actually need a positive polar cone of k. If k is a cone, then the positive polar cone of k is given as a set. That is the, this, this set given equation seven. And since K is a close and convex set, we have that K is equals to K star star. And the negative polar cone is given by equation eight. 
while the negative interior of the, the cone is actually given by equation nine. Then when we assume that C is in K star taking away a singleton zero, it's a compact set such that this we have relation seven, a relation eight, equation eight. Then uh, K star is the conic hull of the convex hull of C. That is, this K star is actually forcing the C to be a, co a cone because we have a conic hull of the convex hull of C. So it's forcing it to be a conic hull, it's forcing it to be a convex hull as well. So in case when we are dealing with a problem and we don't have a convex set, a convex, uh, a convex cone, then we try to manipulate and see that we have what we required. The next thing we are going to uh, see is the Jacobian. Jacobian of F is denoted as JFF, JFX, and the image of the Jacobian is represented as JFX as a linear operator. So one more important thing is the necessary condition for K optimality of, of a cone, which is uh, X bar in Rn is given by relation 11. So if this condition above is satisfied, then the point X in Rn is called a K-critical Pareto or stationary for F at X. However, if Xn is not K-critical, then there is this H in Rn such that this relation hold. This relation where I'm pointing my distance. So if you look at this relation critically, this implies, is just trying to tell you that this Jacobian uh, is a directional derivative in the direction of H which for that simplified as the end of, at the end of this, you can see it, f of x plus rh is list of f of x uh, with respect to k. So one important concept also that we need to know is uh, to look at the, the pictorial representation of a minimal or maximal element of a set. Uh, if you look at this uh, s as a non-empty ordering set, then you notice that we, with, with ordering con C, then uh, we have the minimal element as X bar, which is located here. And then we have the Y bar as maximal element, which is located here. So now we are going to define a function zeta from Rm to R by equation 12. So since we already mentioned it earlier that C is compact, then C and uh, zeta is well-defined, then the function uh, zeta is also gives some characterization of uh, negative cone and the negative interior of a cone as follows. That is by this set, respectively. Then one more important thing is this lemma that also give more characterization of uh, of our zeta, which we define in equation twelve. Now define the function phi from R n to uh, R n cross R n to R by equation 13. So the function pi gives a characterization of k descent directions and k critical points. Notice that since d is k descent direction for f at x, if we have this relation, that is pi of s comma d is strictly less than zero, we have k descent direction, and x is k critical point for f if pi of x comma d k comma d is bigger than or equal to zero for all d, so one more important lemma, which allow us to express this concept that we have mentioned earlier, that is pi of s comma d k is less than zero. In order to find the sufficient descent condition, this lemma also contributed a lot. Now we define uh, the set of minimizers. That is, we define w from Rn to Rn and v from Rn to R by equation four. That is, argument of pi of x comma d plus uh, norm of d square all over two, such that d is in Rn. Also, v of x by equation 15. Since phi of x comma dot is a real valued close and convex function, and d mapped to uh, uh, d square over two is strictly convex, then w x exists and is unique. So in the following number, we will see that the direction w of x and the optimal value, optimum value V of S can be used to characterize stationary point of six, of equation six. So this lemma is also very critical because 
it tells more about how we can obtain k critical or k descent direction for f at x. So one more important thing is we consider multi-objective optimization with k equals to rm plus and see the canonical basis of rm. The ability of this can be computed by solving this equation 16 which is a convex quadratic problem with linear inequality constraint. So uh, as it is in the scalar optimization, we said that a direction D in Rn satisfies the sufficient descent condition at X in Rn. If equation 17 holds for some C in bigger than zero. In addition, we say that the step size alpha K uh, alpha bigger than zero is obtained by means of exact line search. If equation 18 holds, we now give the warp like condition for vector optimization that was introduced by Locambio, Perez, and Prudenti 9 in, in reference 9. So let D be in Rn, be a k descent direction for f at x, and E in k be given vector such that equation 19 holds for all p in C. Now, now, alpha bigger than zero satisfies standard work condition if equation 20 and 21 holds, where rho and sigma is between zero and one. Furthermore, alpha bigger than zero satisfies strong work conditions if equation 20 and 23 holds. Now, we are going to discuss about the convergence analysis, but before then, we need to uh, look at some assumptions that we need to make. Let the cone K be uh, a polyhedral, C be finite set of normalized extremal rays of K star, and let the set uh, this uh, L be, equal, be a set X such that F of X is less of F of X naught with respect to K be bounded, where the starting point is given as X naught in Rn. And then we have assumption two, assumption B, which talk about the Lipschitz continuity of the Jacobian. So this is our algorithms, pro, our proposed algorithm. Uh, in step one, we have a zero a row between zero and one, and e in k as in defined in nineteen, and x not as the starting point be given. So we initialized step two. Step one, we have uh, we compute the value of x and v of x as in fourteen and fifteen respectively. So if v of x is zero, then we stop. Then we now define the dk. We compute DK uh, as defined in 20, uh, equation 24, where our beta K here we considered uh, a modified um, HS table conjugate uh, parameter, which is defined here, equation 25. Then the next step is to compute uh, our step size, which is uh, alpha K, which is positive, such that the strong of condition is hold. Then the last step is to set uh, our next iterate SK to be equal to SK plus uh, step size and such direction. And then we go, uh, then the last thing, we go to step one if this is step four hold. Now, assume that the sequence SK is generated by the proposed algorithm one. By assumption A, we have that SK is in L, which is our first assumption. And so that SK is bounded, thus it follows from lemma 3C and continuity of JF, that is the Jacobian, that there are constant uh, um, eta bigger than zero and gamma bigger than zero such that we have equation 26 and relation 27. In the following lemma, we showed that algorithm two generate descent direction when uh, beta k, our modified beta, beta k NHS is positive, is non zero for all k, and the line such satisfies the strong of condition. So, this is our proposed lemma. Consider algorithm two and let alpha k be guided zero satisfy the strong of condition 23. Then the such direction dk satisfies sufficient descent condition with c equals to one over one plus sigma, where sigma is between zero and one. So in the following, in the next result, we will see that under some mild assumption, vector CG method that has properties that is globally convergent. This result was given, initially given uh, in 
in scalar in scalar formed by by Nosedal and Gilbert and Nosedal in 1992, and it was extended to vector vector form by by Lucambio and Lucambio Peros and Prudenti in 2018. So this is our main result. Suppose that assumption A and B hold, consider algorithm two with beta k modified beta k bigger than zero for all k, so that the sequence sk dk is generated. If alpha k satisfies strong of condition 23, then equation 28 holds. So the next thing in our mind is that is our, this is our picture work. This result, as I have mentioned earlier, this uh, particular lemma and the, the global convergence theorem actually have been proved. It's just that we did not uh, bring down the proof here because of time. So what we have in mind next is actually uh, to carry out the numerical experiment of this problem, which is still a big challenge to us. So, yeah, and possible application. So concluding remark, in this talk, we develop a new algorithm for HS conjugate gradient method for solving vector optimization problem. We proved that the such direction decay defined by our algorithm satisfied a sufficient descent condition, bearing in mind that this important property was not achieved in the work of Le Cambio, Perez, and Prudenti. In addition, we proved the global convergence of the algorithm. These are uh, uh, some of the references. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for, for your presentation. Uh, any question or suggestion? Uh, or suggestion? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jamil and Mr. Arazuka, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, this is a very interesting area. I have seen it uh, in several places, but uh, actually I have many questions associated with this. Uh, perhaps I'll raise some of them here based on your presentation. One of the questions I have is centered uh, with Mr. Arzuka. Okay. Uh, you made mention that. Uh, the HS does not guarantee sufficient descent uh, condition. However, in this year presentation, you consider HS can get ready. What made you make this choice of an algorithm for this particular uh, vector optimization case? Is it that the HS may be better than other, for example, FR, or you just decided to test it? So that uh, after checking the numerical, whatever comes out, you report. No, yeah. Uh, is that the HS has uh, a very good convergence property. So I'm going to use some subguarding in order to ensure that the, the, the effect of not uh, satisfying the sufficient descent condition is, is avoided. I think that's, uh, that's the reason why we choose this. It has a very good uh, convergence property. So we are going to use some some some, 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 some guiding principle in order to ensure uh, we avoid such uh, problem with regards to the HS. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I think I think I think I will add to that. I think um, Dr. Arzuka maybe misunderstood the this thing. He what he is trying to say is that because we made mention there is that uh, LS, HS, and PRP have a uh, Hardly, sometimes they recycle without conversion. Uh, it's because it has been shown by Powell that the FR, DY, CD have more uh, convergence, uh, uh, have better convergence than the PRP, HS, and LS. So in our own case, since it is difficult for one to show that uh, PRP, HS, and LS converges, so that is why we choose to show that this particular case, in, part, in the particular case of vector optimization, we can be able to prove that uh, HS converges strongly uh, globally without having so much headache. And we're able to show that sufficient descent 
are satisfied whenever strong wolf condition is applied. Okay, okay, I understand you now. Uh, another thing I would like to know is uh, in the course of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, it is necessary to have, uh, well, let me say, it, you need a combust corn. If you don't have combust corn, you need to carry out some manipulation to ensure you, you, you can have uh, such uh, a set. So what I want to understand now, does it appear in practice to have such a combust corn, corn or you just uh, do the manipulation based on mathematical formulations? I think, I think, thank you very much for this uh, listen, but I think I have already made mention, as you can see from, from this particular definition of convex form, uh, we said that uh, when you have a shape, a particular like this dot dot in particular, this is not convex actually, because if you like, if you leave it like this without this uh, boundary of square, it is not convex. But how do we make this one to be a convex so that we can to suit our way of uh, or to suit our requirements. So the best thing is to draw lines at the edge of this dot dot. That is, that is as you can see from the right part of the square, we have this in polygon, which actually, uh, if you draw any point, if you take any two point there and draw a line segment, the line segment will be inside the polygon. So that is the, the, the idea of a convex hole or conic hole is just, to force something that looks, that is not actually a convex or a conic to look more of a, con a, a convex or a conic than it was initially given or it was initially found. Okay, I understand here that you are trying to explain convex hole. Convex hole, which is a minimum set of which it is convex first, and then it contains the given set. Uh, that is a very uh, interesting idea, but uh, my main concern is, okay, if you don't have it in practice, then you try to get the closest set that is convex, right? Yes. You apply and get your result from it. Okay, now I understand. So just take me back to the practical no, setting. setting in slide, slide two. two. Okay. Can I, can I make, can I see this? Because, because I have seen interesting, interesting application. Yes. yes. This application else. So, so how did the model of this application uh, give rise to uh, a vector of optimization problem? I'm really interested in this because uh, it's wonderful, very attractive. Yeah. Um. Actually, if you remember, a scalar optimization is actually a. Uh, uh, a kind of optimization that has to do with minimizing a single objective function. But when it comes to uh, vector optimization, it, it deals with minimization of several objective functions with conflicting goals. So uh, that is why if we consider, as I have, maybe I didn't mention, maybe possibly I mentioned it, multi-objective optimization and multi criteria optimization are also a subset of vector optimization. So these applications are more of are more into uh, multi criteria or multi objective optimization actually. But um, my main focus is 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 on the vector optimization. As I have mentioned it earlier, that we are still looking for how to apply it our own distance. But these are motivations we get from so many textbook and so many published articles. So we are just trying to look at how we can be able to apply such a thing in reality just the way others have applied their own. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Please, one last thing. Can I see the, the next page? Next page, next page. Oh, this is not about patient analysis. Yes. I have seen it from the presentation of the drama of Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use the clinicians to solve uh, uh, what do you call the optimization. Yes. Uh, I'm also interested in this type as well, uh, because uh, the case of manifold polemics and the case of other spaces, what we call the three-part metric, yeah. which takes care of part of the rotation analysis. 
I don't know if you did not uh, see such a metric. I will also recommend you to please try to look at that metric and see if yeah, there is a way, way possibly we can look into the study of location analysis specifically to okay. establish optimal places where yeah. some things need to be done. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you very much for this wonderful uh, contribution and suggestion. Okay. Okay, Daniel. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. This is uh, a new area for us. We are excited, even though we are familiar with the single valid case. In your concluding remarks, uh, okay. can we go to your concluding remarks? You made mention uh, in the concluding remarks. There is a place okay. where you made mention that in the other work of Locambio and Perex, they were not able to show the decency condition, right? Yes. So what is the difference between their work and your work? Yeah, actually, um, let me go to the... Okay, um, in the par beta parameter, are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, in the beta part, in the conjugate parameter here, uh, in their own case, uh, this norm of V of uh, norm of the region, that is norm of W of X K by norm of W of X K minus one is not there. And this absolute value we applied close to these uh, norms actually is was not there. So that is why they could not be able to achieve the sufficient descent. So we modified their beta k and we're able to establish the sufficient distance condition yes that's what i expect to see as the concluding remarks that your beta parameter has been modified in such a way that you can obtain the decency condition but also i would like to know now that i see what you did what gives the uh, motivation or to add this uh, parameter there in order yes. to achieve actually as I have said, this uh, uh, particular problem was employed to solve already a uh, uh, single objective optimization problem. It was employed by Wei Yao Liu in 2006. So we mimic his way of uh, modifying the parameter in order to establish this result. So in another way, there is this uh, beta parameter in existence in a single valued case, right? So you extend it now to the... We extend it exactly. Okay, okay. It's clear now. I understand. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for the yeah. suggestion and question. Any other question, please? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. I have okay, a question. Everyone, Thank you uh, very much for... Three, the three minutes left for question. And today we have many, many groups. Okay. We have uh, three minutes for your question. Okay, All right. Can I proceed with my question? Yeah, proceed, proceed, please. Okay, let me first thank you for the wonderful presentation. Vector optimization, I think this is the first time you started in our lab. So it's a remarkable achievement for you to be able to go in, into this direction. So thank my question is you. informed by the call of Dr. Jamil. He said... Okay. The question he asked about the in the conclusion concluding remark. So you said the sufficient descent was they were not able to establish sufficient descent in their own work, right? Yes. So what I want to understand in the classical setting, I mean the single valid function um, setting, without yes. sufficient descent condition, we cannot establish global convergence. Yeah. Is it the same thing in the vector optimization setting? Yes, it's the same thing. So if that's the case, how did they establish the convergence of their own work without the sufficient descent condition? They assume they actually assume that uh with 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 uh, with using uh uh accurately using a land search, the sufficient descent condition may be established. If I yes. get you, if I understand you, it's more like they just assume. It's they assume it. Yes, yes, right. they assume it. 
Yes, they are zoom it. Okay, okay sorry, they, please. You okay? In their in their in the paper, they were able to show that DYs DY that is the die young die die young die young uh conjugate descent also satisfies sufficient this condition. They were able to show that the satisfies sufficient condition, and they were able to show that the they are globally convergence the parameters. But uh, the FR, because they give about five, five conjugate parameters, FR, uh, DY, CD, um, PRP, HS, uh, that, these, are the, these are the five parameters they gave. And the only ones that were able, they, they, they were able to achieve the special descent condition was the CD and DY. Actually, it was the first. It was. It is the first. It was the first paper in, in this direction. So maybe they establish that for, for other people to come into the area and now make their own contributions. All right. Thank you very much. So let me make just few comments on your slide. Okay. 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 Just in case of next time, I think. Okay. Uh, personally, I will. I, I. I think you should have your problem first stated, then you have your application after the problem. Okay. After stating your problem, then you bring the applications. Also, okay. maybe you should try to use um, itemize and bullet, something like that, and post okay. using the post as well. Because okay. I noticed your slides are a little bit wordy as well. Okay, okay. And also, let's okay. go to 17, equation 17. I said something. Okay. Is sufficient descent? Hello? Hello, I, I think this should be for the vector setting, right? Yeah, this I, that's why I said as it is in the scalar optimization, we oh, say okay. that this one is this in the, that is in the, I'm just giving a kind of a, a vector, uh, Extension Definition. of this uh, particular oh, right. sufficient descent condition. Okay, I didn't understand it. I thought you were referring to the scalar as this. No, no, no. All right, All right. Aruzuka, I'm going to explain the scalar one. Thank you very much. So, you must thank welcome. you for the suggestion and the question, sir. You must welcome. Thank you. Right. We'll try and improve next time. Please, Dr. Abdul, can I ask you something? Yes, I'm with you. Yeah, please. Is it appropriate uh, for them to assume special descent condition just to get what they want? Well, for me, I wouldn't say it is appropriate. But you know, in the literature nowadays, there are so many writers, and yes. everybody has his own motive for writing. So we okay. can we can pardon. We cannot say it's wrong, but conventionally, it's very important to establish that condition. Okay, okay, thank you. But since it's, it's one of the pioneer papers, I think, so is since you can just assume and somebody might come and bring a break a breakthrough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations, Dr. Daniel. Thank you very we, much, we Dr. Hope see, we hope to see the numerical part of this work. It's really interesting. Are we internet uh, okay. disconnect? I, I hope so. You see it soon. Yeah, and for the collaboration and look into yeah. the hybrid case. Yeah, yeah, Wait yeah. Minute, I, 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 I'm, I'm on it. Uh, All right. We are waiting for the next presentation. Where is the head? Uh, sorry, Jamil, can you shoot me for hold? Sorry, my internet is unstable. The, the Jamil is the, the new host now. Jamil host now, yeah, yeah. Jamil, yes, can yes, you okay. uh, setting me for host? 
Okay, Dr. Jamil, make her to be the host. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sorry. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, Jamil, Mr. Jamil and Asuka for great presentation. For next group is the Mr. Mahmoud and Mr. Adamu for the topic non monotone based conjugate gradient method for last scale unconstrained optimization problem with application to non negative vector vectorization problem. Okay, are you ready? Okay, if you ready, we start. Uh, please. Okay, please, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we are ready. Okay, good afternoon, all. My name is Adam Yusuf Inwa, and my co presenter is Mahmoud Yamihaya. And we are going to present our lab seminar on non monotone based conjugate gradient method for large scale unconstrained optimization problems with applications in a negative matrix factorization problem. Okay. And this is the outline of our presentation. We will start with motivation. Then we go to, we have enable formulation, unconstrained optimization, algorithm for unconstrained optimization. And then we will go for then algorithm and the result. Then we look at application at the end. Okay, now we go to the motivation. Now, if we all know that if you have an equation like one, it's possible to, you can always factorize it and maybe find the value of x. For example, as you can see, x minus one into x minus one equal to zero. This is a factorization. Okay, now can we do the same for maybe a matrix A of dimension m by n, wherever we can, can we be able to write it as the product of matrix W by H, this one is not a plus, is a times for the polar mistake. Okay, so this problem, we call it the non-negative mat matrix factorization. It has many applications such as clustering, for example, clustering, maybe like which is used by social me me media companies like, you see where you can we have people with different interests, so we can just form a group of them and use that to make suggestion of friends. Like if you see in Facebook, sometimes they will show you someone as you can you do you know this guy, something like that. And we also have recommender system, maybe where also it's used by companies. For example, if you if if you are buying something online, then you take the ratings you give to other products and they try to see what to recommend to you so that you can buy. Another application is the first detection problem, which is used for security purpose. Then how do you formulate this problem? Okay, the problem you can see that suppose the problem is defined by equation three. So suppose X is a set of real it's a, it's a real and negative negative M by N matrix. So the nonlinear the negative matrix matrix population looks for two matrices, say the blue and H such that X is approximately equal to WH, where K is the minimum of less than equal to the minimum of M and N. And you see the problem as equation, given by equation three. So now let's look at unconstrained optimization. So if you have a function, a real, a real valid function depend from Rn into R, then the, 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 the problem of finding the minimum of f of x over the whole rn is called the un unconstrained optimization problem. Normally, we assume that the function f is continuously, twice continuously differentiable fu function. Okay, you know, sometimes it's not always, uh, when you are looking for a problem, it's good to have a, uh, to have an exact solution, an analytic solution. But the problem is that for nonlinear problems, the answer is not always possible to do that. You cannot always get the, the, the analytical solution. So that's why we, we have to sometimes use numerical, so look for numerical solution where we have, we look for maybe a approximate solution by using iterative methods. So these iterative methods are normally a techniques are used as alternatives to getting the solution. 
of such problem. So it's an, an iterative method is a mathematical procedure that you do an initial estimate, maybe say X naught, which will convert to the vicinity of the, of, of the solution X star. So, so it's just like, Okay, yeah, maybe, so maybe for example, some, suppose we have an initial so estimate, say x naught, along with generate an algorithm. Of a, using an algorithm, we generate a sequence, iterate xk, which converge approximately to the solution. Maybe using the, the recurrence relation pi, where, the, where we call alpha k as the step length and dk is a direction. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, Mr. So I will continue from this. So the idea here is we are trying to find an algorithm or formulate an algorithm. And the algorithms are normally defined. And the algorithms normally, as an iterative algorithm, normally start from an initial starting point, uh, which in most cases are zoomed to be random. In most cases, so they're kind of like taken to be very close to the solution. It depends on actually the algorithms. So it uses this recurrence formulation stated in equation number five. And this recur recurrent equation actually, normally people use to call it um, line search based uh, recurrence iteration. So it consists of two things. It consists of the alpha k and then the dk. And the dk is normally uh, what differentiate one algorithm from the other, as you will see in the subsequent presentation slides. So let's start with the alpha k. So how can we be able to find this alpha k? So alpha k normally is being evaluated using what people call line size. And this is actually a kind of one dimensional approach of finding the, uh, the best or suitable alpha such that uh, the function value is being minimized or is being reduced continuously to our iteration process. So in general sense, we, might, we kind of like uh, have mainly two classes of these line searches. We have the exact line search, and then we have the inexact approaches. So normally, the inexact approaches is computationally expensive, particularly for highly dimensional problems or very difficult problems to uh, to approach. Uh, so as a result, people usually approach this uh, approach or propose or form of or used inexact approaches. So one of the approaches known as inexact, kind of like being partitioned or being divided into two. We have what we call a monotone based line search approaches, which uh, I need to vividly stated in this algorithm. So it's kind of like a classical approach whereby you have the inputs and then you have a kind of like the following steps composing of what we call a back tracking line search. So I will discuss more about it probably in the next uh, slides. So the other one is what we call a non monotone line search. Go to the next slide. So the idea of non-monotone line search, if you can remember in the previous uh, slide, we say that we have a monotone. By monotone, we are trying to say that uh, there, is, is, there, is a, there is a kind of like a consecutive uh, uh, down or, dec or decrement of the function value along the iteration process. But in the context of non-monotone, it's kind of like we are trying to say, let's relax that monotonicity property in that line search and by imposing what we call a non-monotone, in the sense that we are kind of like giving the opportunity for a possibility of a functional growth at some point. So this is stated in this equation number six, whereby the M naught is stated is equal to zero when the attraction counter is zero. And this M, normally people call it a memory. It's kind of like bounded by a positive parameter. Let's say uh, that parameter is sitting to be M. So this actually happens to be uh, one of the interesting uh, line search approaches that people uh, come up with in the literature. Uh, it has quite a reasonable number of advantages, which are kind of like outlined here. So this number one, it kind of like uh, improves the likelihood of finding the global optimum of the uh, problem. And also it improves the speed or convergence speed uh, for in a situation whereby the more monotone lines, the monotone lines that approach kind of like creep in the bottom of a up to narrow value. So this actually has, there are some specific problems that have this kind of uh, property, whereby the, in the teacher, the researchers were able to show that using this approach of non monotone can be able to, you know, uh, get rid of or avoid this kind of uh, curve value in the function value or in the function itself. So another advantage is that it kind of uh, have some encouraging properties or numerical advantages, which actually from what we have experimented and from what we have read in the literature, uh, is kind of uh, true for most of these difficult non-linear problems. So you can see some uh, very useful references for 
So but somebody who wants to go further and look into that. So the next thing that we try to ask ourselves is how can we be able to look into this? We study this non mountain line set and then we attempt to uh, see how we can be able to improve it or maybe generalize it if possible. Go to the next slide. So, so what we propose here, we say that it is simply called, we call it modified non monotone line search, whereby in the, in the max term, we incorporated one particular tab, which is simply stated as B to the power of signal function multiplied by this. So this term is actually, uh, V is actually taken to be between this uh, interval zero to one. So normally we call this, actually we are not the first to call this term forgetting factor. So there are some researchers back in 2008, whereby they use this concept called uh, a forgetting factor. In another approach, the paper is called robust variable forgetting factor for in this point algorithm for system identification. So we, uh, we studied it, this approach that they use in their own setting, and then we try to incorporate the same concept into this uh, uh, setting of normal online set. So you can see, Clearly that when V is taken to be equals to one, we are kind of recovering the previous classical non monotone line search approach. Uh, however, if we set V to be something which is very, which is less than one strictly, so in that sense, we are going to have a kind of like a, a weight attached to the function value. Because if you look at it in this equation number seven, we are having the product of this forgetting factor with the function value. So from the numerical experimentation that we started, the only ones that we have started to do, we realized that there is a massive improvement in the numerical setting for this, when you want to use this kind of uh, non-mountain line sets as compared to the previous one. Let's move to the next. Okay, so the next thing that one thinks, uh, has to think about is since, uh, as Mr. Adamu talked about, the problem of non-mountain of uh, non-negative matrix factorization. If you were able to, uh, uh, have a problem or a model, the next question that one needs to ask himself is how can we be able to solve this? So one way of doing it or one approach of uh, solving this is approaching it by using these uh, unconstant optimization algorithms. And as I said previously in the definition of the reference formulation, the DK is what differentiate one algorithm over the other for in the context of line set based algorithms. So this DK here is simply defined like this, so when k is equal to zero, you are just computing a negative of dk in all these uh, uh, very classical and well-known algorithms. Whereby if k is strictly greater than or equal to one, you are having what uh, they call spectral gradient method, whereby you are kind of like computing, uh, you are multiplying uh, this uh, gradient by this positive term, which is alpha uh, lambda k. However, <clears throat> if we have, uh, on the other hand, if the DK is defined like this, whereby for K greater than or equal to zero is defined as kind of like additional term of beta K multiplied by the previous direction. This kind of uh, directions is what people used to call, or with the algorithm, what people call uh, conjugate gradient uh, algorithms. On the other hand, if we kind of like combine this, uh, this spectral gradient and this second part of the conjugate gradient, we end up having what people call spectral conjugate gradient. So in this uh, algorithm, or in this approach that we are trying to look at, we focus mainly on the conjugate gradient uh, version of the direction. And this, as you can see from the, the definition of the conjugate gradient direction, there are one main term that is kind of like uh, uh, different because you already need, you can be able to establish the gradient easily. You have the initial start in the direction, of course, the previous one. But what is different, of course, based on what we know about conjugate gradient, we are trying to generate these directions, right? So you are trying, in this case, we are having what we call a uh, beta k, which is kind of what differentiates one version of non-linear non uh, CG method from another. So these are some of the examples of these uh, kind of parameters. We, uh, we have HS, PRP, uh, PR, uh, sorry, PR and CD. So this algorithm or these variations we're shown to have uh, various properties, advantages, and, and the rest. So uh, another property which is significant in this concept of nonlinear uh, CG is the fact that there is a need for the direction to satisfy what we call uh, distance property, which we kind of stated below. Let me go to the next. So what are we trying to do? So what we try to attempt to do in this uh, work is that 
we studied that Dailio is one of the researchers in this area was able to come up with what we call conjugacy condition. And this conjugacy condition is kind of like a generalization of the classical conjugacy direction that uh, people in this area know about. And uh, it is simply formulated as this equation number 10. And he was able to use this direction and then use the initial CD direction and derive this parameter, beta k, and he derived it as follows. So he was able to show that with this parameter, beta k, over, with this parameter, beta k in equation number 11, he was able to show the global convergence for uniformly non uniformly convex functions. And he was able to do some experimentation with regards to this using one variation of t. As you can see here, there is kind of like a positive term t. So we used variations of this and it was able to show that uh, the global convergence is established for from uniformly convex function in particular. However, he attempts to move further by incorporating, by in att an attempt by him in the same work to be able to find the global convergence for general functions in this case, he then decided to propose these variations taken in this equation number 12. So we were motivated by this work, and then we are also motivated by the fact that uh, the CG method has, as I mentioned, uh, various advantages in regards to the uh, non monotone and in regards to the non monotone lines that algorithms or schemes that one can be able to use, and also with its simplicity in implementation. So uh, what we are trying to, what we try to do in the formulation of this, as you can see in this equation 11 and 10, there is one um, term that is kind of like obscure. What is T? What is T? So we try to, at, in an attempt to find an optimal uh, T, uh, we did the following. Okay. So we coined two optimal parameters. Sorry, I, I'm not the one controlling the slide, so I'm trying to ask him to do, go back up. Go back again. Okay, here, yeah. yeah. So we, we came up with these two optimal parameters of TK of the previous uh, equation number 11 and 12. And we did that by simply solving this uh, optimization problem. So why the DK is simply defined like this? This DK <coughs> is kind of like, uh, we kind of like rewrite the direction itself as dk in this format, okay? Why the i is simply an identity function. So solving this parameter, solving this optimization problem with respect to, with respect to uh, either equation 11 of the beta k dl or equation 12 of beta k dl plus, we are able to obtain the following optimization or optimal term of the t's stated in this equation 14 and 15. So uh, we, then make use of these two uh, optimal parameters and then incorporate them back into uh, the uh, BB para into the dilio B terms and then came up with a such directions called DM1 and DM2. And we use this uh, such direction in stating the algorithm as you can see in the next slides. So let's talk about the algorithm and the uh, numerical, oh, sorry, and you know, the convergence results. So the algorithm has the following uh, kind of like inputs and outputs. So here we have the uh, initialization of terms, and then the next step is computing these two uh, values. And next is kind of like initializing or computing the such direction when k is equal to zero, and then we have this value. So in the first instance, there is a need for choosing or finding the best or suitable term of alpha k using the conditions we stated in the in equation number seven. And then we followed that by simply updating this uh, SK plus one like this. And then the next step, since we have all these terms, we can be able to uh, find the direction of uh, which we call DM1 or DM2. So it's kind of like a composition of two algorithms depending on what uh, direction we are using. And then the next step is simply updating these kind of terms and then the counter of the acceleration will be implemented. So the next uh, or second to the last, Part of this talk is about the, uh, the convergence result. So in the convergence result, we made some assumptions. So the first assumption is assuming that the function, as we mentioned initially, is twice continuous differentiable, and then uh, this uh, level set is assumed to be bounded. And second assumption is that the gradient of the objective function is assumed to be continuous. So which is simply stated in this form. 
And there is another assumption which we haven't mentioned here is uh, that the boundedness of the gradient itself, which we can uh, establish uh, from these assumptions. So the next thing is the state a lemma, which uh, indicates that the direction is uh, decent in this section, and also the boundedness of the direction itself. And finally, we, since we came, we came up with a modification or kind of a generalization of a non monotone line set, we have to we have to have or we have to establish that this kind of line set is well defined, which is critical in this setting. So the last part of this uh, convergence is talking about the uh, global convergence. Of course, this global convergence, as we keep hearing, is simply two was the stationary points, which is simply outlined or stated in this equation number 70. And because in this case, we are trying to say that the convergence is established based on this non monotone line set, so there wasn't any assumption of complexity whatsoever. So the only assumption we have is the uh, continuity of the objection function. So that's why we cannot be able to, in fact, even in the convex setting, one cannot be certain that you can be able to obtain uh, the, the limb of the norm of the gradient directly. Uh, so it's kind of like what we have to get in this setting because of the kind of complication of the problems under consideration. So uh, the last part of this talk is on the application. So for the application, as Mr. Adamu mentioned in the introduction, we are talking about a problem of non-negative matrix factorization, which is, as uh, he mentioned, uh, very important uh, in many application areas. So we have the following outline or scheme of the algorithm, which we kind of incorporate the proposed algorithm in solving. So in the first instance, we have the inputs, which is kind of like uh, the matrix itself. And the idea here is how can we factorize it? Actually, the problem is a non is a uh, it's a non-convex problem. It's kind of like what people call empty hat problems are quite difficult to, to solve or to deal with. So one way that we attempt to look at it is to decompose the whole problem into a easily computable uh, problems as kind of like a variation of a convex. And then we use this kind of like alternation, okay? So in the first, in the first instance, it's kind of like we are fixing the first, the first time that we are trying to obtain and then uh, we are one, one of the first time that we are trying to obtain and then we update the other one. And then on the second alternate, we then fixed uh, the one that we updated previously and then update the, uh, the current one. So it's kind of like an alternated uh, setting. That's how the approach of solving this uh, problem is in this context. So there are some references that one can be able to look into for these kind of uh, problems, which are actually some of them are a little bit new so one can be able to look into this, those uh, references if you one want to look at uh, what this non-major matrix factorization is all about. So uh, can we move further? These are some of the references. Uh -huh, uh -huh, okay. So in conclusion, we discuss or come up with the two optimal parameters of the Dialio conjugate gradient method. And then also we were able to introduce what we call a forgetting factor term. Uh, this is actually what we Kind of like uh, attempt to do in this work beside this derivation of the optimal parameters. And secondly, we are uh, working on towards the numerical experimentations and then implementing the previous algorithms of the non monotone uh, non matrix factorization. And actually, this work is near completion, almost 90% so far. So, uh, in conclusion, or as a future work, we attempt to move further and try to work towards implementing and proposing algorithms that are robust and that can also be applicable in various areas in science and engineering. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your presentation. Any question? Okay, okay Jamil. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for an Adamu, for your wonderful presentation. Okay, I have you, some suggestions, but I will start with the suggestions. Okay, okay. So let's go to the title of the talk. Uh, when I see the title that you say a non-monotone based conjugate gradient method, it's uh, an after when you were explaining the formulation, actually what you really did. 
uh, from my understanding is you are trying to say that uh, you are working with uh, such, uh, such lines that they are producing non-monotone sequences, right? That generate non-monotone sequences mm -hmm. of the step sizes. Yeah, in, not in all cases, to be honest. It's kind of like saying we are talking about a variation of or another approach of finding or obtaining this uh, uh, sequence of uh, step sizes that we're talking about using this non monotone line search based. So, the idea of using this title is kind of like try to indicate that the CG approach that we are trying to propose is based on that uh, kind of line search, yes, yes, I based on that. the classical ones. Yes, I'm coming. I understand what you are trying to say, but what I want to say is uh, you are gen you are using uh, some such lines that uh, they are generating non-monotone sequences of step sizes, right? So I think, thank God that uh, I was happy also to hear that the work is almost finished. So I, I would suggest that uh, the title here is a little bit misleading when you okay. put put that it, uh, look at it, when you put it that way. You understand? Okay. So I think you should be able to modify so that you concentrate more on the uh, main contribution of the work. Because the main contribution of the work is on the such directions, right? Yeah, it's kind of like combination of two. So it's kind of like talking about uh, the line search itself and then the proposal of the beta parameter that is normally people mm -hmm. use to do this concept. So it's a combination of two things. I've got, I agree with you that there is a need for looking into the, like, the titles. In fact, it is even more wordy. It's kind of like more than 19 or close to 19 years. So it's a bit long. So yes, that's look into, look and into the word for not, not on there is the keyword there. So you should yeah, try it's also to a keyword. Appropriate. It is. It is. Yes. Uh, and then another thing also, uh, let's, let's, let's go to, there is the lemma. I think your first lemma. Yes, there is a lemma. Okay, the other lemma. I think there is another I, lemma. I, I think you have only one lemma for now. In fact, there are others, but yeah, yeah, this one. Also, you know, I still emphasize on the contribution on uh, the main work. Since now you establish another non-monotone uh, search line where you get the optimal uh, value of the parameter involved there, I suggest this issues, you start the lemma with trying to show the wild definiteness of this, uh, your line search, you understand, which is very important. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> So maybe yeah. we can we can we can rewrite it. We can form another lemma and then establish it. Yes, separately yes, from this. Unless inequalities. even if it requires some of the uh, you understand items there in A or B, you can bring that one first. Then you brought the other one as a lemma. Yes, yes, yes. I thank you very much. And it will come immediately after the derivation of the touch line, so that yeah, the exactly. that we have exactly. a well defined. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, these are the main suggestions I have. And the question is, uh, can we go to the main algorithm under the application where for the matrix factorization? Okay. This is a nice, uh, you know, application. And this is the first time I've come across it. As you mentioned, it is applied in many applications. But here, I would have loved to see how you break down in terms of your algorithm. So remember, in your algorithm, you have GKs, which I guess they are the gradient of the function involved, right? So yes. I think essentially, if you can be able to break it down in the paper or here at the presentation, even if you don't want to put it in your article, you can try to relate what is this means, what did this means, you know, already yes. we've gone for the parameters, but for the yes. objective function, we need to know how you break it down or how you decompose it, what matrix you need uh, to yes. be one. Yes, actually there are quite some few things that are omitted in this algorithm. Uh, so <clears throat> with regards to the issue of how the algorithm is being used. So this is, the algorithm is actually used in trying to solve for the UK in this first update. And it is also used in trying to solve this, or uh, find or solve this particular HK transform. So this is why the algorithm is used. And secondly, if you look at this uh, while loop, 
actually there is another condition about the gradient itself, which I haven't mentioned here due to uh, time and then it is yeah, but what I'm saying now, what, what is the gradient now in terms of this your matrix W that you are trying to decompose like this? Or what what is what here? With the, 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 the gradients, the gradients actually are based on the on each H. Uh, it's based it's based on H and W. Actually, the, the formulation, the you know, first of all, we have the algorithm stated earlier for CG, right? Yeah. And the what the original one I made mention is actually stated best purposely for solving just like a classical, sorry, not classical, let's say benchmark test purpose. So the scheme stated earlier for the CG specifically meant for solving test problems. I haven't stated an algorithm specifically or kind of like outline how the steps of the normal procedure when solving this kind of problem explicitly here. But actually it's kind of like more or less like the one that you have earlier, uh, whereby you have to have the condition of uh, finding or establishing that the norm is to be less than equals to, uh, while the, uh, sorry, you have to have this condition post uh, kind of like initial condition in the while loop. Can you go back to the algorithm, Mr. The algorithm. So this, this while loop that we have, we have to have it. That means we need to be able to find the gradient or uh, sorry, establish or you know, formulate because it's easy to be able to establish the gradient of the original problem formulated for the non monotone line set. So the gradient of that with respect to the first page. And then the, the, the other one, when the other one in the second update, we are talking about the gradient of the second uh, term, which is W. So both the two algorithms are kind of like strictly not exactly the same thing in the, in, uh, when trying to formulate it or when trying to implement it. Okay, so uh, I, I take your point that uh, there is a need for kind of like uh, maybe putting it explicitly, which is uh, not what people mostly do, but I think it's a good thing to do so that people will understand it's exactly what you're trying to do. Thank you. Yes, that, that's my point. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. Okay, thank you, thank you. I have a question, please. Okay, doctor, go ahead. Let me, let me start by saying it's a very beautiful presentation by the group. And you know, as we are aging, scientists used to say the brain cells are always dying. So we need to keep learning all the time. Exactly. So I have to ask questions. Right. So first I, I will agree with Dr. Jamil about the title of the the title of the talk. Yes. Secondly, is let me see the problem you are trying to solve. Is it the normal minimization problem? It is a normal minimization problem. In fact, the, okay. there are two problems that we are trying to solve, right? The first one are kind of like uh, the benchmark test problems, which we simply know. But the second one is trying to reformulate this equation to as a as All right. kind of like on Okay. Oh, yes, two problems, right? So there are two problems. So, okay. so now what you have done basically is uh, introducing a new conjugate gradient method based on dial your condition yes. to solve these problems. Yes. But you're using a non monotone line search now, right? Yes. I mean, so, what will be the difference? What is the difference if we, suppose you have to use something like a, a strong wolf, a visual line search? What will be the difference between them? Yeah, actually, actually, as I said, uh, the experiments are preliminary, but from what we attempt to do, uh, there is a comparison that we did uh, using uh, Hada and Zan, which yes. uh, uses strong wolf line search. And from what we established in the experimentation, yes. the performance of this. Uh, formulation based on this uh, normal to is uh, better. I can say better in the sense that based on the test problems on that consideration. Well, and, and likewise, if you look at the unusual, the, the strong wolf and the wolf themselves, they are kind of like a bit, uh, uh, they have kind of like a strong conditions or strong, in another word, we can think of this as kind of like trying to circumvent the the, the problem or kind of like uh, uh, the, the issue of trying to compute, also the time to use the line set, which is, uh, we're trying to use the strong line set, which we normally know that it's kind of like a bit computational we gave it as compared to this non-mortal line set. But this is not the only uh, uh, idea or the only advantage that we are trying to get. So All right. in other words, we are just dealing with this equation number seven strictly. But in the context of a strong line set and others, you can quickly see that there are other conditions which need to be satisfied 
but I agree with you that uh, uh, this is an experimentation and this is something that one has to experiment and over and over to be able to establish in generality uh, that this is better or this is not. All right, um, Mahmoud, the other problem you're trying to solve will involve mm -hmm. matrices, right? Yes, which is also a heavy but, problem as well. Yeah. Good. So, but the conjugate is more of it's trying to avoid the competition of matrix. So, how will how will you think it will handle it effectively? Yeah, that's why that's why if you look at the problem itself, it's kind of like a, a inner while loops, kind of like a combination of not of while. So, in another word, the computation of that step and you go back to the algorithm is the okay. no, not this one. Okay, so if you look at this algorithm, the non modern line set, in the updates, this is W, right? We are trying to compute for it. This is a matrix itself. But the way we compute it is not strictly looking at it as a matrix. We are looking at it explicitly as the vectors. Since we know that matrix is a composition of vectors, isn't it? So, so we compute, the computation is actually uh, best for looking at this matrix itself as simply a vector, right? So that's how actually the implementation is done. I, and at the same time, it's a bit uh, heavy, right? Because we are saying that this is matrix, this is that, but one can be able to implement this efficiently. All right, thank you very much, Mahmoud. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mahmoud, for this talk. You're welcome, Doctor. Right. Please, can I take a look at uh, slide 16? Slide 16. Where you made mention of non monotone line search. Yes, yes. Yes, I will start by commenting on this um, equation six or inequality six. Okay. You can see a comma that appears there. That makes it a little ugly, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Echo. Thank you. Thank you for And that. also, there is a need for maybe a check of all this. Yes. And also, from the representation perspective, I don't know what do you mean by F with a super secret K minus J bracket. The so, one inside, uh, the one that uh, the maximum acts on. So, so actually, what what this what this thing kind of means is we are kind of like having. That's why I'm not mentioning sure we have what we call a memory. This memory is basically trying to say that you have a kind of like a, since F itself, we are just trying to compute a value, right? So. The idea here is, if you can be able to, uh, if you can be able to talk about a given sequence of function values, which you can decide by this particular m. Okay, let's say you take m to be equal to five. So the max that we are trying to obtain here, we are trying to obtain over this, this, uh, this five range or to this five uh, memory that we are trying to talk about. So the memory is kind of like m is kind of implemented which stores the values, the function values themselves. And at the point whereby we are trying to obtain or trying to find the, uh, the alpha, we then need to take the maximum over those five function values that you obtain. Okay. okay. So this, is, yeah. this, this is the idea here, not yeah, strictly like, what uh, we are trying to do. Yeah. I hope my explanation is- A step of x k minus k minus g. That's, the, that's what it's standing for. Oh, okay. Actually, F from K, F of x k minus g, that's what it's standing for. Oh, okay. we forget oh, to write it. Why F that? Is just a search not, not notation? Yes, yes. It's important to state that because uh, F actually represents a function. And when you just put F with super secret like that, people will ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it, uh, the yeah, function they should, they values. Should, yeah, they, they should ask questions. But my point here is we have like kind of an interval of the. Uh, an interval of this x in this j where it's coming from, right? Yes. It's coming from this interval between where between zero and this minimum of this max. So, which basically means that this j is simply counting this number of m's that you have. Okay. Okay. Uh, from your explanation, you say we are the system is storing some function values. F on its own is a function. Then function mm -hmm. value is f at a point. Yes. So, so the point there, that is what is missing. For example, from the left side, I you say f yes, at Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I get your point. Your okay. point here is uh, 
we just write f of k minus one without explicitly writing uh, writing it as f of x k minus j. So, yes. of course, there is the x j which we kind of omit here. But uh, thank you for this uh, notice. Okay. We'll try to look at it. And explain okay. better later. <clears throat> okay. Pro can you go to the next slide? Just, uh, let me go to the next slide. Okay. This is a modified non-monotone line set. Exactly. Right? And you stated that um, there is a massive improvement as far as the conversion is concerned Not with regard that. to the modified non-monotone line search well, in comparison with the monotone line search. Yeah, yeah. Not, not only the, not about the convergence in some sense, because convergence, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of established already for, um, you can establish convergence for not only non mountain lines that are based uh, algorithms. So uh, the idea, what I'm trying to pinpoint here about the usefulness of adding this term is, number one, you can be able to establish the previous formulation of the non mountain line set as was classically uh, formulated. And secondly, you can be able to, uh, if you decide this particular alpha is less than one, then in that sense, in that setting, you have kind of like a weight being multiplied to the function value within that range that I talked about earlier. So this kind of like makes it makes the function values at the current point uh, having more uh, taking more advantage or being used uh, be, becoming more useful in some sense. And then those that are previous previous function values they are kind of being neglected over the iteration process. So this is kind of the effect. And we are trying to of course uh, the v term that we said that it is between zero and one. We are trying to experiment by using different values of uh, alpha and see what will be the difference in terms of uh, the performance numerically. Okay, okay. So it's empirical uh, uh, measure you used. So, yes. but do you think one can be able to establish analytically that uh, this fall within some kind of uh, convergence rate different from? The yeah, actually, the, the, the issue of convergence rate. Is something that we haven't looked at here okay. uh, because uh, what we are looking at only here is the global convergence. Uh, and I, I agree with you that uh, there is a need for thinking in that direction of uh, showing the convergence rate of this kind of algorithms. Uh, but actually, there is less research in that approach. I don't know why people in the CG uh, world are not trying to look into that, but it's something that maybe. Uh, it needs to be looked Shall at. Shall I say a little? Maybe because it's all the same thing. You don't, maybe the class will not change. It will still remain in the same class. That is why people are not disturbed. Sorry, I can't hear you. What, what are you saying? I wanted, to chip, I wanted to chip in with regards to the convergence rate. Mm -hmm. I think people are avoiding it because it will just be a repetition. Most of them oh, will no. fall within the same class. Uh, actually, convergence rate is, uh, to some extent, is, actually, it's another way of showing convergence, but people, from another area, try to look into. In fact, there are others that looked at only the convergence rate as the most important thing to, to show us. In our so uh, it actually depends on the where you are, where people are looking into, or how you looked into the issue. But I agree with you, there is a less uh, thinking in that direction. But um, of course, I don't know why is that the case. And uh, of course, there are so one or two research that try to do it, but. It's not that too uh, well known or well uh, thought of. I don't know why, but probably as you said, always because people looked at it as um, the same thing. But uh, uh, please, if, if I may in, uh, since we are still in this phase, page. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I I I am suggesting that more investigation should be carried out on this parameter that is added. Because uh, what I'm suggesting is if you could be able to, since these parameters you see at each iteration is generating a number, right? Yes, if you take it not as a and constant. Also, yes, and also the difference of the function values there is another number. So if I would suggest if you can analyze this number based on like different simulations, what kind of numbers are they generating? Because- Which I, numbers, which numbers, Doctor? It, yeah, is that making me think that maybe this your modification uh, modification might have even pause 
the whole of the uh, force the whole of the sequences that are generating to be monotone. Mm, well, you understand? So a lot of, uh, I'm not saying exactly, but a lot of things has happened with this modification that make it in such a way that is uh, that is a great improvement in terms of the safe sizes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can think of it as it's not like strictly saying that it's always going to be. Uh, non monotone to some extent because we are just saying that within a no, given no, interval. So no, I'm not contesting about the monotonicity of what uh, you know the sequences is generating. What I'm saying is, since this is the main uh, contribution of this work, if you can have some experiment in order to just show empirically the behaviors of what these sequences are actually about, especially if you mm -hmm. compare between the F at kg minus, that is the difference of those function values and the one that you just put. What kind of values are they generating? Yes, yes. Actually, this is something that uh, we are experimenting as well to see what is the difference uh, between when we incorporate the forgetting factor itself and we have, and if we haven't uh, uh, incorporated that. And this is something that I, I, I was thinking also about because uh, the functions that we are trying to look into um, might not always be the same in all settings, right? And secondly, the the these line sets or this variation of line sets uh, that we are talking about, of course, you can use it. In this case, we use it for CG, right? But you can use it for other forms of uh, algorithms like uh, 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 Newtons, parser Newtons, and other variations of algorithms which uses line sets. So there is a need for like experimentation, a lot of them, for sure to check what is the effect of this parameter that was incorporated into the call of the factor. But from what we attempt to do, not with comparing others that of course is very helpful when we did not incorporate the beta term uh, as was obtained in the classical setting of the non-monotone line set. Uh, but I take your point, there is a need for ex extensive experimentation and then a kind of like a good report out of but not really extensive, but at least you can compare the values that are generated between the parameters and see what uh, what yes, are yes, put yes, more yes, yes, it can be done. Ah, what kind yeah, of it, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, Mahmoud, the motivation of the modification, is it from the numerical perspective or theoretically? It's from the numerical only for now, because that's what we are trying to look into. But at the same time, um, the convergence is also something that, that is helpful because we are able to obtain the convergence, uh, which is kind of like some extent, uh, almost the same in the previous uh, line set based no motor line Okay, set. so still your convergence is still dependent on the line sets? Of course it is dependent. That's why we are saying that the convergence uh, is independent of uh, the functions, uh, the, the assumption of the function value is not uh, just to continue to the function value and the of so, Sorry, so you didn't use the line set in, in, in any way in the convergence? We used the line set in the convergence. We used the line set in the convergence. Okay. That's the, what, 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 I'm trying, what I'm trying to point out here is the convergence is obtained using the, uh, using the line sets explicitly, but at the same time, the use of the the use of the line set in showing the convergence was able to give us the opportunity to uh, uh, not necessarily assume the complexity of the function value. Right. Okay, I get the point. So I think there is just uh, there is theoretical motivation as well. Of course, there is. Of course, there is. Okay. That's great. But like try to one my last comment. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, from equation 13, we have capital D raised uh, to K. So I would like to know here you put where DK equals to I minus some maximum of term. Yes. So this I is, is what? Is I it is an identity? identity? It's an identity. Identity element. Yes. Oh. And the TK, the T itself must have a T. We omitted it here, but there is a T. Is okay, a okay, T. okay. So, so what do you mean by maximum of these two elements? Zero is a vector, right? And the other two elements, the other element there, it's a number also. The scalar. Yes. Oh, so you now have identity 
minus a single number. What does it mean mathematically here? Actually, actually, there is there, there is an identity attached to the second term, which is not like it, oh there is an identity attached to it. Okay, okay, thank you very if much. If you look at if you look if you look at it, actually, I, I haven't I haven't put it here. Of course, there is. Yeah, I mean the second term is just a scalar term. Yes, yes. So the other one is a vector. So I'm concerned about there, the there minus. Is, there of... is an identity attached to the second term. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Thank okay, you. that's fine. Thank you very much for this talk. I'm okay. I'm convinced with your, your... So is there any suggestions, uh, questions, what not? Okay, sorry everyone today. Uh, for now, it's time um, Thumbs up. Thank you okay. for a uh, nice presentation, Mahmoud and Adamo. Okay, thank, thank you, thank okay. you. Okay. Good job, okay, good for, job. Very nice. For next group. Okay. Are you ready? Uh PB and I. Actually, I'm not ready, but I have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I share, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can share screen. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next group is the Mr. Pawisha and Miss Kanokwan for the topic general. Inertial man iteration and their uh, convergent analysis for non expensive mapping. Okay, let's start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenokwan Katulak and Pavisha. Today, we would like to present group in the topic general iterations man algorithms for non expensive mapping. Uh, we will talk a uh, full section. In the first section is introduction, and the second section is main result, and the third section is applications, and the fourth section is numerical agreement, and the last section is future lesson collection. In this study, we begin with definition of non expensive Let H be a cubic space, and C be a non empty horse convex subset of H. A mapping T is for non exclusive if set by dish for X, Y, and C. Now we consider the fixed point problem of non exclusive mapping. Suppose that a mapping T is a non exclusive mapping with a set fixed point set is non empty. Find a point X start in C such that equation one, the set of our Fixed point of T above is denoted by FT state by dish. Approximating fixed point problem for non extensive mappings has a warranty of specific applications. Fine, many problems can be seen as a fixed point problem of non extensive mappings, such that convex first variety problems, monotone variational inequality, and so on. In 2011, Mishuri et al. proposed big point framework in their study of total relations model for image denoising and finding a fixed point of a non extensive mapping was embedded in their algorithm. Uh, in 2013 and 2016, Shen et al. showed the convergence of Primal dual fixed point algorithms with aid of fixed point theory of uh, the non extensive mapping. One of the more used algorithms is man algorithms that find equation two. The iterative sequence x in above convert weakly to a fixed point of t. Provides that sequence alpha in belong to into all zero one state five right in generally the convergent rate of math algorithm is very slow as the theory of our last scale problems in 2014 Sakurai and Liduka point out that to volunteer practical systems and networks stable and reliable the fixed point had to be quickly found so, there are increasing interest in study of FAD algorithms for approximating fixed point of non extensive mapping. 
to the best of our knowledge, there are two main ways to speed up the man algorithm. One way is combined conjugate guardian method and the man algorithm to construct the cellulite man algorithm. This work what made future anal analysis of a combining of indigenous extrapolations with man algorithm. Now we consider the following minimizations problems defined. Equation three, for x in h, where phi is a given function and a differential table. Are in 1964, for yard firstly used to solve a minimization problem and core is an initial type exploration algorithm. Define equation four. Form for Yak's work and acceleration's focus in indigenous extrapolations and algorithms were widely studied. Ex theory, recently research construct many intuitive algorithms by using indigenous extrapolation, such that an indigenous forward backward algorithm. Indigenous gradient method and fast accuracy. Chain cut the supporting algorithms in choice FISPA. By using the technique of the indigenous extrapolations in 2008, Mianc introduced the classic, classical indigenous man algorithms defined equation 5. He showed that uh, sequence X in converted weakly to a fixed point of T under condition A1, A2, and A3. Find the condition A2 is very thick, thin, bored, and static. Uh, change to condition A2 and substitute A1 and A3 with foreign conditions B1 and B2. Where lambda, omega, delta are positive constant. Motivated by above results in this work, Dong et al. introduced a general indigenous man algorithm to approximate fixed point of non equancy mapping, which include two step classical indicators and man algorithm. The proposed method provides we convergent theorem. In the application, they apply the main result to minimization problem. Vì lương phần mai nữa tao. Ok. Sorry. Ok. Sorry for the problem. Ok. Ok. Let me start. In, I'm just start with the main results section. Okay, I will begin with the general initial man algorithm proposed by Don Detto, which is the sequence UN, WN, and HN generated by um, equations number six, where sequence alpha n, beta n, and lambda n certify the condition C1 and C2. So what is what is it? Uh, the, the, the new the new of uh, this work the new is uh, they they use two two step two steps of uh, initial extrapolation and they consider the new condition of the step size alpha n and beta n and uh, and also sequence uh, lambda n so now, if we look at the, the sequence number six, we see that if sequence alpha n equal to beta n and then sequence u, u n equal, equals uh, sequence 
the bin you in so we have so we have the following classical initial man algorithm which is proposed by man uh, mean next if we look if we look at the sequence if uh, sequence beta n equal to zero and then we see that sequence w n is x n so we obtain uh so the general general initial man algorithm we come to the selected initial man algorithm proposed by don and you and the last one if uh sequence lem uh if n equal to zero that's mean that's mean um you can do n is x and so we have the reflected initial man algorithms proposed by Dong Yoto. So now um so so now we give the big commodity theorem for the general initial man algorithm. If if the sequence un w w n and x n plus one define as the uh, equation number six, which is uh, we certify the condition c one and c two, and then we conclude that the sequence convert really to a fixed point of mapping t. Here t is non apensive mapping. We also we also have the special case when L sequence alpha n equal to beta n. That's it. The general initial man algorithm reduced reduce to classical initial man algorithm proposed by man. So we also obtained the converse. Uh, uh, we also obtained the weak, weakly convergent theorem. So now we are we are talking to the application of uh, the main problems. So now we consider the constraint convex minimization problem as defined as the, the problem number nine. Here C is closed convex subset of a Huber, Huber space H and and phi is real value convex function. Uh, and we denote the solution of the problem number nine by gamma, and we know that if uh, function phi x is differentiable, then uh, x bar solve the problem number nine if and only if it solve the prob uh it solve problem uh it it solve a fixed point problem. Number ten here, PC is mean that uh, PC is a metric rotation from S onto C, and it defined by the, the 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 defined by the definition eleven. Uh, so now for solving the con uh, constraint convex minimization problem. The the algorithm. Uh, the 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 sequence in defy as a equation number twelve is called gradient projection algorithm for solving um the problem the the the, the, the constraint convex minimization problems. Here, um, gamma n is a step site, which is a positive constant, and PC is metric position from H onto C. So now, the general initial man algorithm can be reduced to the general initial gradient position algorithm as defined as the sequence UN w n and sequence n plus one in the equation number 13 so now we see that everything is to be the same only only this plate to be replaced to t 
and uh, uh, where sequence alpha n, beta n, and lambda n satisfy the condition C1 and C2 as well. And the obtained following result that it um, the uh, that that it uh, uh, we assume that the solution set is non empty and the gradient of the function free is to for the Lipschitz condition like this and and the step side gamma in belong to this set so the sequence it in un and the bun generated by equation number 13 converts really to a minimizer of a problem uh number nine that is constraint convert minimization problem so now we present uh one in simple to show the performance of a uh, uh, classical initial man uh, algorithm. Um, as I said, initial man algorithm and our uh, our proposed method, general initial man algorithms. So we consider with the easy example here. Uh, T is a uh, that is a. Uh, is a cube function where x belong to uh, minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 and and the fifth point of t is zero so now um we fit a sequence lambda n alpha n and beta n equal to 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and 0 0.6 respectively. And we consider two takes. The, the first take is um, we run with the n equal to 1 to 10 and set the difference value, values of uh, initial, initial points, x0 and x1. We uh, difference uh, different uh, four, four cases. And now this is the graph of a uh, case number one, number two, number three, and number four. Mm. From from the figure is a uh, mm, from the figure is is observed that uh, the 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 sequence is. It's not uh, quite different when uh, in in uh, ten to infinity. That means in uh, ten to or uh, I mean ten to yes, yeah, yeah, ten to infinity. So the second case we we set it as a stopping criteria and we consider focus as well so uh, this is the first case second case and uh, what is this uh, yes the third case and the fourth case so it seems that uh, three occurring terms uh, are not quite different so Uh, how, however, we 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 show only once as simple, so I, I I'm I cannot conclude uh, the result right now. But we give the following future research direction. Uh, for for the first direction, we we may con consider the condition C. Oh, sorry, this is C, not C two. We may consider the condition C1 and C2 to choose the new condition, which may uh, provide that the algorithm has a better, better performance. Also, we 
because uh, our algorithm uh, provides uh, only weak convergent theorem, so we may consider our our main algorithm to uh, for the strong convergent theorem. This, uh, as I as I told already, that uh, I can I can not uh, I cannot conclude the result right now because uh, I'm just show one example. So now um, I want to uh, I want to find more examples and and test the algorithms to see the behaviors of uh, algorithms. Mm. Uh, and here we uh, our our mapping is non invasive mapping, so we may consider the the other class of a non invasive mapping that is a quasi non invasive only non invasive or uh, straight piece of construction or another mappings, for example. And the last one is. Uh, we can modify a general initial mind algorithm and general initial gradient position algorithm for solving the this problem and minimization problem. Um, we may consider the the another type of a uh, condition of uh, step size or consider with the uh, another initial extrapolation. This is uh, our our remark and for the future research duration. So these are some references. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your nice presentation. Oh, any question for the or suggestion for them? Hello. Hello, Jamil. Uh, for which, thank you for a nice presentation. No, no, no this is not nice presentation. <laughs> okay. I have two questions. Yes, please. First of all, uh, this paper, is it published already? And which year has it been published? Mm, this paper, not yet. Okay, this is a new work? Mm. No, this is not a, not exactly, but you know we are try trying to get the, some idea of uh, of our work, so that's why we are consider the 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 idea of uh, two steps, initial interpolation, and you see, and the equation number six. Yeah, but this algorithm uh, looks to me familiar with a work in two thousand and eighteen. Mm hmm. Yes. You yeah, the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think this has already been published. So oh, yes. yes, I agree. Said in your future directions, you can look at uh, trying to, like you say, extend or modify or do something related to it. And also, why I ask about the year is there are other now algorithm with this double inertia that you recently published that you need to look at them in order to. Oh. Be able to oh. Oh. Oh, that's yeah. That's also, serious. This is serious. Question: uh, What is the difference between in the next slide between the algorithm proposed by Mianji, yeah, this one, and the algorithm proposed by the Dong et al. Okay. What friends? Hmm. Sorry. Yes. What One is the between algorithm five and seven? Five and seven. Yes. Yes. Oh, 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 only one place, Jamil. Only one place. If you see, you can see that the difference is just one place here. No, but to go back to the main algorithm, by which. Okay. You know, now if you take uh, alpha n to zero, what do you have? Oh, uh, let me check. Five, right? Alpha in alpha in two zero. That's yes. mean I have this one. You have five. You have you have uh six, right? Uh 
excuse me, let me let me check. Uh, you said that if I in ten to no, zero. No, what I said is algorithms uh five and six. Okay, the next fine. the next one. Okay. Yes, and the next the other one. You mean this? The statement you make, you say if beta n is zero, we have this, right? Yes. Okay, the difference, the other one is a day. You know, but but you did not use the okay. Okay, I see, I understand now. <laughs> Sorry, but I I, I I don't understand yet. <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm, I'm the one asking the question. Now I see, and also I, I thought, uh, but which are also the inertial technique used by Dong is the incorporation of the conjugate gradient method. Mm -hmm. While while the other one is the normal extrapolation uh, mm -hmm. that we, that is what I thought is the difference between the two also. Uh -huh. Because, uh, you know, go back to your algorithm. Okay. The, yeah, this algorithm, if you look at it, the first initial extrapolation was obtained using the conjugate gradient uh, technique. What's the problem? Hello? 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 Hello, professor. Do you have some problem, uh, general initial man iteration? Uh, which is uh, different from uh, Seu's uh, uh, two-step uh, initial algorithm. Different from Seu's. Mm -hmm. Seu, yes, Seu yes. recently Seu introduced uh, two-step initial algorithm. Okay. Uh, which is different from okay, Seu's uh, two-step uh, iteration. Yeah. Uh, initial yeah. algorithm. Yes, Professor, what, what we are asking is, Professor, the first initial extrapolation, the one with the alpha n, is it obtained using the conjugate uh, gradient technique, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you alpha and beta and uh, equal alpha and beta over alpha and zero over beta and zero, and then we can sum uh, a well-known algorithm. Uh, you give a remark in this uh, talk. I think no problem any. Okay, Professor. Yeah. Okay, Pawich. Yep. Okay. Please, please show me your main result. Hello. Uh, hello, brother. Uh, please let me know, uh, show me the main result of your result. Main result, professor, I think, uh, sorry, we don't put it here, professor, we just show the theorem. Uh, theorem one? Yes, we, we put only the the theorem, professor, we didn't put the proof or uh, uh, another details, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, in the future research uh, of your talk, uh, maybe you, uh, want to show the strong convergence of uh, your algorithm. Right? Yes, 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 right, percent, right. Yeah, yes, uh, it is uh, many, uh, many, many kind of algorithm. We, we, we can introduce many kind of algorithm yes. uh, uh, with, uh, uh, by using uh, your algorithm and uh, uh, Piscosity, Hoffman, and uh, many kind of iteration, and then you can show strong oh. conversion. Okay, professor. Thank yeah, you yeah. very much. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, you know, generalized iteration uh, two in this case is uh, different from Seu's two-step algorithm. Mm -hmm. Can you understand? Yes, the present, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on this Friday, I can 
uh, introduce uh, two, I, I compare two uh, step algorithm of uh, mine and uh, Seus, okay? That's very interesting, Mr. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it, we can uh, extend the multiple step uh, initial algorithm. Multiple steps. So yeah. how, many, step. how many steps? <laughs> uh, multiple steps. Already we, uh, I and the Professor Dong together have published uh, in multiple initial Karanesor schema algorithm in oh. Journal of Global Algorithm. Oh, Already yes, published uh, this paper. Friday, I show you this paper. Okay, we are looking for your presentation, whether Yeah, multiple step. Yes, we are looking for your presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Mm -hmm. Let me show, let me make a yeah, comment. Me. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, please, so please, please. Now, just like the no, 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 no. a new concept. Excuse me, one more time, please. As the dump inertia, dump, dump inertia. You mean this? Hello? I said. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Abdul, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Now is there's it a, new, a new kind of inertia now, the dumped inertia. You can look into it. Dump inertia. Yeah. Can you spell? Please. D A M P E D. D A M B. P P P. P uh, D A M P. Yes, I can maybe I can share some article with you later. Oh thank you very much. This is also inertia? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. I just um I just here to I just here right now. I never know before. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Okay, thank you very much. So I yeah, I, I uh send you the pile of uh, general uh initial algorithm uh in the two step in case I have uh, published this paper in uh uh, in 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 uh, monograph edited okay. by yeah yeah, yeah uh, Russia's professor Russia's uh, I send you PDF file of this paper if you need uh, uh, very thank soon you I much, send you this file yeah yes thank you very much I'm um, very yeah. very appreciated thank you very much very appreciated. Hello, Dr. Parisha. Good, oh, good morning. Hello, good morning, right? Mahmoud. Sorry? I think, it's, I think it's morning, right? Yeah, yes, morning. That's right. Very cold. Uh, yes, not so cold right now, like a eight, uh, 8 or 10 degrees Celsius. That's good. It's not so cold. Okay, that's good. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I think I have a suggestion. Can you go to slide 27? Yeah, please, please. Say when? 27. 27. Okay. 27. 27. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think oh. this condition, maybe there is a typo. It should be Y, right? Not X, Y, is it? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's all the observation I have. Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, I thank see you, right thank now. You. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Any question or suggestion? Okay. If no, any question? Thank you for your nice presentation. Okay, okay, today we have a last group. Uh, we have a last group for today. Um, so I want to tell sorry for Ramsan and uh, Arif for I share the time of you and not tell you before. Sorry. Mm, okay. So sorry. Okay, are you ready? Yes, we are ready. 
Okay, you can share screen and let's start. Okay. Can you see my screen? <clears throat> yes, I can see. Okay, may, may I start now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this group presentation. And uh, here we are three members for this group presentation. And uh, first, my name is Asfa. And the uh, other two group members are Mr. Muhammad Arif and Mr. Muhammad Ramzan. So the title of uh, this group presentation is Heat Transfer Analysis of the Mixed Convective Flow of Magnet Magnetohydrodynamic Hybrid Nanofluid Past a Stretching Sheet with Velocity and Thermal Slip Condition. So next. This is the lay layout of our presentation. First, we will describe a uh, brief introduction. Then there will be a, liter a literature review. After that, we will do a mathematical modeling, and then there will be a final conclusion. So let's start with the basic introduction. So first one, there is the uh, basic definition of the fluid, a material that has no fixed shape and deform under an applied stress. So this is the basic definition of fluid. Here we have two types of fluid, Newtonian and non-Newtonian. Newtonian fluids, those fluids which obey Newtonian's law of viscosity, like water. And on the other hand, non-Newtonian fluid, those fluids which do not obey Newtonian's law of vis viscosity. And for example, we can take honey, jelly, or blood. So this is the formulation of the nanofluid. Uh, nanofluid is basically uh, defined as when we add some nanoparticles in our base fluid. So it uh, then in the result, we get our uh, nanofluid. So now the applications of nanofluid, uh, there are a lot of applications of nanofluid. First one, like heat transfer intensification. We use electronic uh, in electronic applications, in transportation, in industry cooling application, also in heating, building, and reducing pollution. Nanofluid is also used for nuclear system cooling, space and defense, solar absorption, mechanical application, magnetic sealing, and biomedical application. So this is the uh, actually advanced form of the nano uh, fluid. Uh, we can say this is the hybrid nano fluid. Basically in base fluid, when we add more than one nanoparticle, two different type of nanoparticles. So it uh, gives uh, in reserve, we get a hybrid nano fluids. So here we present some thermophysical properties of base fluid, nano fluid and hybrid fluid, which include thermal conductivity, their viscosity, their specific heat and density. So now this is the mechanism of heat transfer that how heat can be transferred through different ways. So we have uh, three different way, uh, ways here like conduction, convection and radiation. So this is the heat transfer method. We can see here uh, the conduction, convection and radiation is given in example. And uh, we can see when we touch, we, uh, conduction it happen when we touch through the um, uh, rod or any medium, but convection is happening under the fluid due to the particle, particles and their movement and radiation is like a uh, heat transfer method in the form of rays. So the magnetohydrodynamic uh, is the study of the magnetic properties and behavior of electrically conducting fluid. So their application is given here, like we use it here in a magnetic therapy, in MRI and in magnetic hypothermia. So the scope of this research is uh, analytical solution will be obtained for the velocity and temperature of the hybrid nanofluid by using homotopy analysis method and the obtained result will be plotted for various physical parameters and discussed in uh, will be discussed in graphical form so this is the significance of this research work the outcomes obtained from this research can improve heat transfer in a variety of industrial engineering fields the theoretical results will play the role of the 
hallmark for the fluid flow problem. And flow problems related to fluid mechanics are useful in real world application, such as power plants, hydraulic machines, and automobiles like. So this study is crucial in the solution of nonlinear differential equation. It has application in different areas of life, such as science, finance, and engineering. Uh, the main significance of the present work is that it is very useful in different fields of bioengineering and engineering, including magnetic drug, trajecting system, magnetic hypothermia, directing of magnetic drugs, and etc. Further, the applications of Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluid models for higher order non-linear uh, differential equations are discussed. So uh, these are the some papers that we used in our literature review. Next, please. So this is the research methodology uh, for this presentation. First, we will do the mathematical formulation. For this, we will uh, make our governing equation and their associated initial and boundary condition. After that, we will make our system dimensional less uh, and we will convert our PD into OD. And by using the HAM method in Mathematica, Mathematica we will find our solutions uh, for temperature field and velocity field. And at the end, we will uh, represent our results in the graphical representation. So for here, uh, I will call my other uh, group member, Mr. Muhammad Ramzan, and he will proceed from here. Thank you. Uh, now I will discuss the formulation of the problem. Uh, first, I will take some flow assumptions on the fluid. The fluid will be steady flow, two-dimensional flow. We will discuss applied magnetic field, and also further we will discuss mixed convection effect, thermal radiation, and jaw lighting effect are also considered in this study, we consider two nanoparticles. Therefore, this is a study of hybrid nanofluid. On a hybrid nanofluid, we will discuss heat source impact and slip and no slip conditions. And we will use exponentially stretching surface. This is the geometry of the problem. Here, UW and VW are the stretching velocities. TW is the surface temperature and T infinity is the ambient temperature of the fluid where G is the gravity. The fluid motion is generated due to the motion of the plate, motion of the vertical plate, the sheet, vertical sheet. Equation one is the velocity equation, is the continuity equations, and equation two is the momentum equation, in, and equation three is the temperature equations. On the basis of above mentioned flow assumptions, we have some boundary conditions defined in equation number four, where sigma NF, HNF is the electrical conductivity of the hybrid nanofluid and rho CPHNF is the heat capacitancy of the hybrid nanofluid, where A1 and B1 are the slip constant. These are thermophysical properties which we'll use for the simulation of the problem. And the values of, in this study, we will use silver and magnesium oxide nanoparticles because we have a hybrid nanofluid and we will mix silver and magnesium oxide nanoparticles in our water and the pro thermophysical properties of these nanoparticles and water are defined in these tables. Now we will use a similarity transformations defined in equation number six. By using this similarity transformations, equation number two, temperature, velocity and temperatures Equation number three, temperature are changed into a dimensionless form in equation number seven and eight. Similarly, the boundary conditions also change by using this similarity transformations into ordinary differential form. After this simulations, we have some non-dimensional variables where RD is the radiation parameter, Q is the heat generation parameter, PR is the Prandtl number, and EC is accurate number, M is the magnetic field, and lambda one is the mixed convection parameter. A, B are the slip constant, where S is the section parameter. Now for the, for the computation of skin fraction and nasal number, we have defined in equation number 10. 
11, where CF is the skin fraction coefficient and UX is the Nessel number. By using this equation, we can find out the heat transfer of the model, where tau W and QW are defined. By using the similarity tra transformation, define in equation number six, the dimensionless form of the skin fraction coefficient CF, CF and Nessel number new X are defined in equation number 12. Solution of the problem is obtained by using the homotopy analysis method. For this investigation, computer-based programming software Mathematica 10 is used. Now, this is the last part of our presentations. I will invite Mr. Muhammad Arif. They will present result and discussion. Hello, Hello. Uh, Ramjan. Yes, yes. Uh, can you please uh, make me host? Ab, ab, discuss karlo, main karta because I, I, I have some amendment in the slides. Okay, okay. Okay, I will try. Click on my name. Yes, yes. No, it's not changed. Hello, sorry. Yes, uh, yes. You cannot host because for now I have a host. If you want to control the slide of the Ramsan, I think this cannot. Uh, actually, I have some amendment in the slides. That's why. Uh, okay, uh, let's start uh, from the, from figure two. Actually, in result discussion section, uh, we we show the graphical analysis of the obtained solutions in order to see the impact of each parameters on the flow flow. So, in this section, we will show some uh, graphs which will show us the behavior of different pertinent parameters in the flow. So figure two is plotted for the, uh, in our, for this, uh, which highlights the impact of stretching parameter on the last year. Where A is equal to zero shows the no slip condition. So if you see the figure, from the figure, uh, the stretching parameter is measured of the rate of deformation of a fluid element in a fluid flow. When the stretching parameter is increased, it means that the fluid element is being uh, stretched more. Sorry, rapidly. sorry, Ali. I think it's your microphone is uh, have some problem because the echo is mm, it, the the the. the. Uh, wait, wait. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes. Now okay? Yes. Hello. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Okay, okay. So uh, figure two shows the impact of uh, stretching parameter on the velocity profile. As I explained before that stretching parameter is uh, the rate of deformation of a fluid element in a fluid flow. When the stretching parameter is increased, it means that the fluid element is being stretched more rapidly, which in turn leads to an increase in the fluid velocity. So uh, overall, an increase in the stretching parameter leads to a more intense and dynamic fluid flow, which results in higher fluid velocities. Next slide, please. 
Figure three shows the variation in the velocity profile for mixed convection parameter. What is mixed convection parameter? Mixed convection is a type of fluid flow that occurs when both natural convection caused by buoyancy forces due to temperature differences and force convection caused by an external driving forces such as pump or fan. So when these two forces are combined, then it, we call it mixed convection flow. So in mixed convection flow, the fluid velocity is affected by both natural and force convections. And uh, overall, these, the increase of these mixed convection forces, the mixed convection can increase the fluid velocity due to the combination of buoyancy and external forces, enhanced mixing and increase the turbulence. So as the turbulency increase in the fluid, the velocity will definitely increase. However, the specific effect of mixed convection on fluid velocity can depend on the specific flow conditions, geometry, and flow properties as well. Okay, next. Hmm. Figure four variation in velocity profile for magnetic field parameter. So actually magnetic field is uh, uh, when we increase the magnetic parameter, uh, it develops some low, uh, some resistive forces. These resistive forces is known as Lorentz forces. So these Lorentz forces are responsible to oppose which opposes the motion of the fluid velocity due to which the velocity of the fluid decreases. And from the figure, it can be seen that higher values of F of M decrease the velocity of the fluid. And as I, I, as I explained before, A zero is equal to zero. We have two conditions. A is equal to zero shows the no slip condition. And for A greater than zero, it means we have some slip condition at the boundary. Next slide, please. Okay, figure five shows the velocity profile for suction parameter. Now, what is suction? The suction parameter refers to the flow rate of the beam belt removed or sucked out of the system through a suction device or a pump. When there is a suction in a system, the pressure at the suction end is lower than the pressure at the discharge end. So this pressure difference causes the fluid to flow towards the suction end of the system. In other words, we can say that the suction parameter increases more fluid is removed from the system, which decrease the overall flow rate of the fluid. This is because the fluid has less volume to flow through and the pressure difference between the suction and discharge end of the system is reduced. So additionally, uh, the suction effect may also cause a reduction in the pressure and velocity of the fluid near the suction end of the system. So this is due to the fact that the suction device or pump creates a partial vacuum, which can cause the fluid to, uh, to cavitate or from the air bubbles Cavitation can cause damage to the system and decrease the efficiency of the pump. So further reducing the fluid velocity. Therefore, it is important to properly design and maintain the suction system to minimize the cavitation and ensure the optimal fluid flow. So it has a lot of applications in fluid flow and many other fields of sciences. Next, please. So figure six shows the variation in elastic profile for stretching parameter. Now, uh, as uh, uh, stretching parameter is uh, is the parameter which is uh, which uh, which can extend the area. So when we stretch the surface, it can produce more deformation rate. So uh, as we increase uh, the the deformation rate, so it can it can accelerate the fluid velocity. As I discussed this before, for uh, a is equal to zero. Now the same these these graphs are repeating. These are I arranged in my slides, but now I cannot uh, share my own slides. So the same physical explanation, uh, I don't want to repeat it, but just the only difference in this figure and fi the second figure is that, that here in this case, we have a uh, slip condition. And in that figure, we have no slip condition. Okay, similarly, uh, figure seven shows the, uh, Mixed convection, as I explained in a very brief detail, that how mixed convection affects the fluid velocity and how the fluid velocity increases. But the only difference of the previous figure and this is that this figure is plotted for the uh, slip condition, and that was for the no slip condition. Next, please. And I also discussed the magnetic effect on the velocity of the fluid. It reduced the velocity for suction, uh, for slip condition and no slip condition. Next slide, please. Okay, here uh, we have a uh, suction parameter as I explained a few minutes before. 
the suction parameter reduced the velocity of the fluid, and I explained a physical example. Uh, but this graph shows only no slip condition. And before it was a slip condition. Okay, figure 10 shows the variation in the velocity profile for nanoparticles volume fraction. So we have a lot of uh, figures uh, which, which is plotted for the volume fraction. Here, if you see phi 1, phi 1 shows the first nanoparticle as uh, Mr. Muhammad Ramzan discussed that we have taken hybrid nanofluid. We have taken two nanoparticles, silver and magnesium oxide, and they are mixed up to form a hybrid fluid in the base fluid water. So here, phi is shows the silver nanoparticle, the concentration of silver nanoparticle. So increasing the concentration of the nanoparticle will increase the viscosity of the fluid. So as a result, the fluid velocity decreases. In other words, as the volume fraction of nanoparticle increases, the velocity decreases. This is because nanoparticles have a large surface area per unit volume, then the fluid molecules, and then they create additional resistance to the fluid flow. This additional resistance led to a decrease in the fluid velocity. And uh, in addition to this, when nanoparticles are added to a fluid, they can also change the fluid viscosity. So when the fluid is viscous, so definitely the velocity will be decreases. Next, please. So this is also the same, the same effect on the first uh, nanoparticle on the velocity of the fluid, but before it was for the slip condition, and here we have no slip, uh, no slip condition. Okay, now phi two shows the impact of second nanoparticle on the fluid. So second nanoparticle was the magnesium oxide. So what will happen to the fluid velocity if we increase the concentration of magnesium oxide nanoparticle in the base fluid water by keeping the first nanoparticle, which is silver, constant. By keeping silver constant and vary, would keep, keep varying the second nanoparticle, which is magnesium oxide. So it also affects the fluid velocity. And this effect can be seen that the fluid velocity decreases by increasing the concentration of the second nanoparticles. The same, the same explanation here, um, no need to repeat, that increasing the concentration of the nanoparticle will, will produce some resistive forces. That resistive force is called viscous forces and which, which are responsible to retard the velocity of the fluid. And A is equal to zero shows no slip condition and A is equal, A greater than zero shows slip condition. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, now temperature, the impact of Eckert number and temperature profile. So actually, what is, what is the Eckert number? The Eckert number is a dimensionless parameter used in the fluid mechanics to describe the ratio of kinetic energy to thermal energy in a fluid flow. And it is defined as the ratio of the kinetic energy per unit mass of the fluid to the specific heat capacity at constant pressure times the temperature difference. So the increase in temperature can occur through a number of mechanisms. For example, in compressible flow, uh, an increase in the Eckert number can lead to an increase in the entropy of the fluid, which in turn can increase its temperature. Additionally, in turbulent flow, an increase in the Eckert number can lead to greater dissipation of kinetic energy through the turbulent mixing, which can also increase the temperature of the fluid. Um, and uh, in addition to this, it is worth noting that the exact relationship between the Eckert number and the temperature of the fluid can depend on a variety of factors, like including the specific fluid properties, the fluid, the flow conditions, and the geometry of the flow. However, in general, an increase in Eckert number is likely to lead to an increase in the temperature of the fluid. Next slide, please. Okay, this figure shows the variation in temperature profile for stretching parameter. So as I discussed before, the stretching parameter is a dimensionless parameter used in floor mechanics to describe the stretching effect on a fluid flow. So it is defined as the ratio of the velocity of a stretching surface to the free stream velocity. So uh, if when we increase this stretching effect, it increase the resistive forces within the fluid. So these resistive forces will transfer some kinetic, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the, the some energy will lost from the system. As a result, the energy of the system will be decreases. So 
By increasing the stretching parameter, the temperature of the fluid decreases. Okay, magnetic parameter on the temperature profile. So the impact of magnetic parameter on temperature profile is shown in figure 16. From the figure, we can see that uh, magnetic parameters such as magnetic field strength can increase the temperature of a fluid through a process known as magnetic heating. So magnetic heating occurs when a magnetic field is applied to a conductive fluid, such as metal or electrolyte solution. So causing the fluid to heat up due to the conversion of magnetic energy into thermal energy. So that's why the magnetic field indi induces it current uh, currents in the fluid, which generate heat due to the resistance of the fluid to the flow of current. And this process is similar to the way that a Y heats up when an electric current is passed through it. But the heat generated by the eddy current in the fluid increases the fluid temperature, which can be useful in various industrial processes, such as in a magnetic stirring, induction heating, and magnetic fluid hypothermia for cancer treatment. So it has useful application in biological science. Next slide, please. Okay, figure 17 shows the variation in temperature profile for heating uh, for heat generation parameter. So uh, heat generation is actually the generation, heat generation can increase the temperature of the fluid because temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. So in that substances, and adding heat to a substance increases the kinetic energy of its particles. So as a result, when heat is added to a fluid, its particles gain energy and start moving faster, colliding with other and transferring their energy. So as the kinetic energy of the particle increase, the temperature of the fluid will also increase. So this is why heat is often used to rise the temperature of fluid. For example, in cooking, heating water, or heating up a roof, all these are the examples of heat generation. Next slide, please. Radiation, variation in temperature profile for thermal radiation parameter. So radiation is one of the three modes of heat transfer along with conduction, convection, and radiation as discussed by Asifa. So uh, radiation occurs when energy is transferred in the form of electromagnetic waves, such as lighter, uh, such as light or uh, infrared radiation, when a fluid is exposed to a radiation, the energy from the radiation is absorbed by the fluid, causing its temperature to increase. So this is the reason that the temperature of the system increases by increasing the radiation of the system. So the increase in temperature of the fluid due to radiation depends on several factors, like including the intensity of the radiation, the distance between the radiation source and the fluid, and the properties of the fluid, for example, fluid that are more opaque to radiation will absorb more energy and experience a greater temperature increase. And the fluid that are more transparent to radiation, they, they will have. So it depends on many circumstances. So overall, the radiation parameter, which refers to the ability of a fluid to absorb and emit radiation, play an important role in the determining how much energy is transferred to the fluid via radiation and consequently how much the fluid temperature increases. Next slide, please. Okay, now, now figure 18 shows the variation in temperature profile for section parameters. So the section parameter refers to the pressure difference between the inlet and outlet of a fluid system, such as pump or compressor. So this pressure difference affects the temperature of the fluid in the system. And the suction parameter is one of the factors that can impact this uh, temperature. Like uh, uh, for increase in the suction parameter will generally result a decrease in temperature of the fluid, while a decrease in the suction parameter will result an increase in the temperature of the fluid. So however, important to note that there are many other factors that can also impact the temperature of the fluid in a fluid system. And the section parameter is just one of these factors. Next slide, please. Now, acre number, uh, the same, these are repeating again, as I explained before. But before the figure I show to you, B is equal to zero, is show the energy with no slip, and here B greater than zero uh, with slip conditions. And now move to the next slide, please. 
the next slide same same is uh, these are the repeating parameters only the difference is b equal to 0 and b greater than 0 next slide please uh, the volume one yes this one now uh, the volume fraction parameter effect on temperature profile so when a fluid flow through a channel or pipe, it experiences a resistance due to the friction between the fluid and the surface of the channel or pipe. So this friction causes a transfer of energy from the fluid to a channel, so which results in a conversion of the fluid kinetic energy into heat. So this heat is like a, a then dissipate into the surrounding environment, causing the temperature of the fluid to increase. So in case of nanoparticles, their small size allow them to interact more strongly with the fluid molecules, leading to an increase in the volume fraction of the fluid. And